LeBron James wins a fifth championship this year. It will be one of the crown jewels of his career to do it with this team the way the regular season went. But all he will do is further cement himself as number two all time. <laughs> Whoa! He does not move himself up to number no one no matter bleeding. what. No, no goat bleeding from legs. We got none of it there. Wouldn't I, do it. Fidel, let me come to you. What if... The Warriors come all the way back from 3-1 down and win this series. I think Clay and Draymond are going to have an absolute field day with all those old Cleveland 3-1 jokes. Yeah. They are going to turn it all around. Draymond's going to be on every show in the world saying, see, you all gave up on us. It was never meant to be. They will be the big winners. I, I love that one. And how about the other way? Hey, Zach Lowe, what if the Lakers close it out tonight in game five? Uh, they'll be very happy. That's a nice outcome for them. I mean, they'd be thrilled. What the real answer is, it becomes Warriors dynasty watch time. How do they try to put this team back together? Are all three core pieces going to be Warriors for life? What happens with Jordan Poole? What happens with Bob Myers? All those questions that have been over here now come over here right at center stage. Well, let's go over there a minute. Let, let, let's come right here. I'll let you know because I promised you Doris Burke we're having some small technical issues getting Doris ready to go. We will have her hopefully coming up in a few minutes. But let's live there for a moment here. In the event that the Warrior season comes to an end, be it tonight or Friday night or somewhere along the line in this series, then what does happen? This is one of the truly great dynasties that we've seen in NBA history. For those three guys and the coach to stay together as long as they have and be the core, we've not seen that more than a handful of times in the history of the sport. Is it over when it ends here? I'm not ready to say that now. And you're right to say when we talk about the Warriors dynasty on the player side, we're talking about those three guys. Yeah. Everyone else has come and gone for the most part. It's those three guys. And part of that is going to be Draymond Green's decision. He has a player option. If he wants to leave and he has a deal lined up that's better than what he can get financially with the Warriors, the decision is out of Golden State's control. He can leave. I'm not willing to just write that off and say it's over. These guys all love each other. They've been around each other a long time. They certainly have lived through a lot of Draymond drama and come out better for it, and they're still really good. It might be more likely they tinker around the edges and try, can we move Jordan Poole to save some money? What happens to some of the other guys like that? What happens to Bob Myers? You know, he's he's still without a contract at the, at the top of the organization. So there are some questions, but I wouldn't just write it off like those core guys are over. We'll never see them play together again. I think that's too extreme. All right, fair enough. And literally, as I was talking about the technical problems we were having with Doris, I then immediately was told in that moment they got fixed. So I can bring the great, the Hall of Famer Doris Burke into the conversation. Hello, DB. As Mike Green would say, Good hey, morning. DB. Good, Good morning. morning. We're in the midst of a conversation about, about the significance of, of this game tonight, Lakers-Warriors, because these two, you know, obviously the legendary franchises and the legendary stars and all the rest of that. Let's X and O this thing. As you've been watching it, um, we, we have seen the Lakers put the Warriors into a big hole. What's the one most important thing you think the Warriors need to get done on the floor tonight to extend this to a game six and maybe beyond? Well, I'm looking directly at Clay Thompson because Jordan Poole has not been uh, trustworthy enough for uh, Steve Kerr to keep him on the floor for longer stretches, right? He plays him 10 minutes. He gives him a brief glimpse. He turns it over right away, and you see the early hook from Steve Kerr. So in the one game the Warriors won, what did Clay do? He was that shot maker extraordinaire. He goes for 30 points. I think he makes 11 for 18. Um, without that pressure that Jordan Poole can put on defenses and alleviate some of that scoring pressure uh, on Clay Thompson. I'm also looking at Andrew Wiggins, who had a couple of open three opportunities. This can't be all Steph. And just to, to Zach's point, right, this dynasty, I'm not prepared to give up on the champs yet, but it feels tenuous. And I'm going to go back to something Steve Kerr talked to us about at the start of the playoffs, because and legs may, you know, poo poo this idea, but I believe in it deeply at their best. The soul and spirit of the Warriors, that collective bond that this group had, and Zach just touched on this, those three guys, that's been pivotal to their success. You can't put a number on it. You can't define it. But I asked Steve Kerr, is that soul and spirit what it once was? And his answer was, we're as close as we've been. And mm. I traced that line directly back to the, to the Draymond punch. They have spent 82 games, six months, and now a couple of series trying to get back to the who they are. Now, there are problems basketball-wise, the turnovers, the poor shot selection, the lack of quality depth. All of that is contributing. 
but they're, this group feels different. And I wonder long term about Bob Myers. And if he departs, what impact does that have on Steve Kerr? I am with Zach. I'm not prepared to give up because you're going to have to put the champs on the mat. But it feels more tenuous than it ever has, Greeny. Well, that's, it's, it's such a, a fascinating thing, Tim, because we can go big picture as we are or, or littler picture, which is uh, tonight trying to win and crawl their way back into the series, which they believe they can do. But let's go to that bigger picture. Generally speaking, does it feel as though there has been something fractured? I think most people know what Doris is referring to, the incident that took place between Draymond Green and Jordan Poole at the beginning of the season. And they've said all the right things, or they've put that behind them, but it's easy to understand, and, and you were a player, where that would be a difficult thing to get past. And then you and I I've talked about maybe Poole with a lot of the criticism he received after the bad shot he took at the end of game one. Maybe he's still recovering from that. Do you, do you think that this team just does not have the cohesiveness that we have been accustomed to seeing them have over the, the decade or so they've been so good? Yeah, I fully agree with what Doris just said. There, there's definitely a different vibe about this group. But I think when we start talking about, is this it? Is this the end of the road? Typically, when we get to that point with groups that have accomplished a lot together, a couple of one of two things usually happens. Their best player typically is no longer a guy that, as your best player, can lead you to a championship. Mm. That's not the case with the Golden State Warriors. Steph Curry is still that guy, or it's broken up because two stars can't coexist. Right, and looked at like the Lakers would be a great example. Kobe and Shaq, they right. had more work to do. Fetty falling on top of the Warriors, and we were saying, oh, this team's about to go on an even better run. They have all these young pieces, <laughs> Kaminga and Moody and the center. Who's Wiseman. Named, uh, James yeah. Wiseman, whose name I have already forgotten, uh, that, that, that was going to lead them into the next iteration, and that has not, clearly at this moment, does not appear as though it's going to be the case. So let, let's, let's put them to the side for the moment, Doris, and let's talk about the Lakers. Now, here's a team, and, and, and Legs makes fun of me because I make him talk about them all year long when they're bad. And now, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, here they are, and, and they're a win away from the Western Conference Final, and Vegas has them as the co-favorite to win the championship. What are you seeing from LeBron's group right now? Well, I think it starts on the defensive end of the floor. And if you think about Darvin Ham's history as part of that Detroit Pistons championship squad in 2004, if you think about his history as an assistant coach under Mike Budenholzer, it all begins with rim protection and what they do on the defensive end of the floor, Mike. And listen, Anthony Davis has contested by far the most shots in the playoffs. He's holding opponents to 28%. To me, it feels like he is absolutely everywhere. And we have spent an awful lot of time discussing what Anthony Davis's variability on the offensive end of the floor has been. And that's appropriate. But this guy has been as dominant defensively. That youth and athleticism, Jared Vanderbilt, you know, what the play they got from Lonnie Walker, th those infusions help. Here's what I'm curious about tonight on offensively. And Darvin Ham talked to us a little bit about this a couple weeks ago. Anthony Davis, because of where his jump shooting is right now, his sweet spot is sort of that short jumper in the paint. So you don't typically think of a big man a little pinned down into a curl and a short jump shot. If they can get him the ball on the move, if he can rim run and get, you know, four to six to eight points off uh, offensive rebound putbacks or beating the Warriors up the floor in transition, you know, without trying at his size, just by rim running, he can get to six, eight points. And then you start to see the ball go in and now a little post up. Now your jump shot flows a little bit smoother. But this guy has been as dominant and brilliant defensively as we have seen throughout this postseason can we count on it legs they need one more monster performance from Anthony Davis and when, when he gave them that in game one I remember I was talking you know on the countdown guys and they were saying he can't do it consistently he doesn't have to do it seven times right they need it four times is tonight the night can he do it again tonight you know I have been lobbying for them to put all their eggs into the basket of game six I have not gotten any support on that. That's okay. I've, I've died on worse hills than this before. Can Anthony Davis give them to that tonight? Well, that Fr to them tonight? Friedel was your star witness on this argument. You brought in Doris. I can't wait to hear her input on All this right. suggestion. So let's get to that first All before right. I right. answer your question. Here's, here's what I'd say. I, 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 I defer, obviously, to your expertise. You've forgotten more about the game today than I'll ever know. But I've been watching it my whole life. 50 years I've been watching basketball. Stop Tonight. Stop prefacing this. Stop prefacing Tonight. it. I am a hard no on this. Okay. <laughs> you don't she never mess around to the with the game. Stand. Go ahead, Doris. You don't Go. Mess around. You, you oh. do not mess around with the game, Greeny. You don't. If you're healthy and well, you play. You've proven you can win on their home floor. 
I am a believer in sort of basketball karma. Who is to say you can take nothing for granted, particularly with, with the injury history of Anthony Davis? Let's say he tweaks an ankle rebounding in traffic at the start of game uh, six at home. Or LeBron James, who most mere mortals, if they suffered the foot injury that he suffered, would have shut it down a while ago. I take nothing for granted. Stop it. There's no prefacing necessary. You don't do it. <laughs> Here's the the only argument I'll make. I, I will make my last gasp. This is me begging from pleading from the witness stand, okay? The worst scenario, in my opinion, is that you play the Lakers play tonight like their season is on the line. They play LeBron 43 minutes, they play Anthony Davis 44 minutes, and they lose. Right. And now they, they go home and those guys are very likely not at their best Friday night when they, in my view, have the better chance to win. Does that not move you at all, Tim? Like that is a very schlep rock approach to it, right? You walk around with <laughs> rain over your head all day. Well, yes. study, because what if they play 43 <laughs> minutes and win, Greeny? That's possible. And now the series is over and you get even more rest, right? And, and like I've been saying, the biggest thing you cannot do is mess around and let Klay Thompson get unleashed where he goes off and he feels like a different player going into game six. Maybe even Jordan Poole yeah. finds himself, right? So, you know what's crazy? I think the tone of this whole thing is this, but this is a completely one-sided series. Here's the irony. Except for some questionable shot selection on the part of the Warriors in a couple of games and Larry Walker giving him a 15-point fourth quarter, which yeah. wasn't done in over a quarter of a century right. for the Lakers, okay? Up there, but for that... We're at 2-2 and feeling a whole lot different about where this series is. So, I'm not ready to write off the Warriors just yet. And that's why Anthony Davis, LeBron James are going to play in game five. Thank you for watching ESPN on YouTube. For live streaming sports and premium content, subscribe to ESPN+.